We are here on Stribblings, New York, with my guest again this week, David Petruja, noted author who's been compared to Tom Wolfe, H.L. Mencken, Eric Larson, Theodore White, David McCullough. The list is endless, but let's talk about his books. Last week, we discussed his book, uh, Rothstein, and his latest book is called 1932, The Rise of Hitler and FDR. And we're going to talk about Franklin Delano Roosevelt today. Uh, I was interested, having read the book, about his impact in New York City and New York State. Uh, he lived in New York. He was a stockbroker. He had the most hilarious business card uh, that, that I've ever heard of. I think if you told people that that, that was the uh, uh, president of the United States card when he was a young man, he, can you, do you remember what it said? It was, it was a long one. It was like a paragraph long. Yes. He was at uh, some firm, Ledyard and some, something or other. And he's talking about how he gives advice to like maiden ants and, and, and how the chloroform small dogs and, and, you know, kick infants or something. I don't know. Yeah, that, that's, it's, that's it's in a nutshell. It's very strange. It's like, it's like the W.C. Fields it, it business card. It was the card. Oddest, oddest business card in a day where like people walked around. And very were seriously. Gentlemen. He was not cut out to be an attorney. <laughs> he yeah, was it, cut out to be Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah, it, it's, you know, I, I, I had this image in my head of Roosevelt and what he was like. I mean, you have a clear image of, like, Teddy, but FDR, he just seemed like this very patrician guy. He smoked cigarettes with a cigarette holder, for God's sakes, and he, he spoke the way he spoke, and he just seemed, like, very uptight when I— I read the thing about the business card that he, you know, he was available to chloroform small dogs. I, la I literally laughed out loud at that. Yeah, well, well you know, you, you think he's sort of like Thurston Howell the third, and and the way he is, and and people underestimate his skills, uh, and and his great skill is politics and schmoozing and and having letters sent out under his signature, and when people come in. They leave thinking that, oh, he agrees with me, and uh, no, not necessarily. But in the meantime, you've come away thinking that he, he's the greatest guy you've, you've ever met. Um, but, but what's there? What, what is there behind him? What does he want to do before, uh, in attaining the presidency? And no one is quite sure in 1932. Uh, one of the subtitles of the book is, well, the, the sub subtitle is Two Tales of politics, betrayal, and unlikely destiny, and he has all the advantages that should rise one to the president, raise one to the presidency: uh, wealth, education, Harvard. Uh, he's the pr cousin, a remote cousin of the president of the United States, a very popular one, and still people think he's he's a lightweight. And of course, there's the polio thing, uh, which they go to great lengths to hide from the general public. Although some people who, who do see it, you know, can only marvel at his, his courage and tenacity. Well, so uh, he was an athlete and he, had, he was involved in a lot of different things up until getting the polio. So I was also surprised to learn in the book that he would not, he didn't consider that he ever would have been president had he not been become, as he described himself, a cripple. I think I think it raised his personality, gave him some empathy with with other people. Francis Perkins, who knew him when he was in the New York State Senate, uh, thought that he, it had raised him him up. Uh, he gives the nominating address for Alfred E. Smith at 1924 at the old Madison Square Garden in Madison Square. And people see him hobbling to the podium on those crutches and very hardened observers are just a move to tears and to uh, the most exultant adjectives to describe his, his address. This makes his career because prior to that, four years before, he had been a failed vice presidential candidate. Who comes back from that? Yet he does. And four years later, he's elected governor of New York, you say, well, what's so hard about that for a Democrat? Well, it's a massive Republican year. His mentor at this point, Alfred Emanuel Smith, was crushed nationally and crushed in New York State by Herbert Hoover. But Franklin Roosevelt wins by the skin of his teeth and what, then goes on to be a fairly successful governor. What was it about Alfred E. Smith that had this big impact on politics and, and New York? Because we still have the Al, the Al Smith dinner. And, uh, it's, it, and so, you know, it's, it's a name that's carried through into, into 
today's politics. Yeah, Smith is a was a is a phenomenally popular governor. He's elected in 1918. He loses in that 1920 Republican landslide. Wins 22, 24, 26. Uh, people. He he is a a machine. He's a machine politician, but he's also a machine at looking at government documents and process. So he is a serious student of government. When he's in Albany as an assemblyman, he spends all his night in the rooms, not slugging them back. Oh, people thought he was a heavy drinker, but he'd be back in his room reading every bill so he knew the details of everything, and he made government work, and he ran a fairly— he, Oftentimes, Tammany would put up front men. Some, Roosevelt was, in fact, like that when he ran for governor. Uh, but also Smith well, and, didn't they, and, they Robert, that- and Robert Wagner, because they would put forward guys who were clean. Even though they were dirty, they knew they had to give something back to the people. Didn't they first assume that Roosevelt wasn't going to make it, and that's why they put him in? Uh, what they thought was, one, he was a, a lightweight, and also— uh, Smith is saying, you go down to Warm Springs, you get healthier, Frank. And Herbert Lehman, your lieutenant governor, he can do a great job. And if you need any other help, I will take a room at the DeWitt Clinton down the street from the executive mansion in Albany, and I'll help you out with whatever you need. And you should also keep in Bell Moskowitz, my secretary, uh, meaning chief of staff. That's the, the real meaning of that title as yours. Franklin Roosevelt doesn't want her, even though she's a, a seminal figure in in women holding positions of power in America. But he's she's too much of a Smith person. He wants his own people around him. And Smith also wants another person to keep on his uh, for Roosevelt to keep on his secretary of state, a guy named Robert Moses. But Franklin Roosevelt hates Robert Moses because he would not give a patronage appointment to Louis McHenry Howe, the great right-hand man of Franklin Roosevelt at this period. But Roosevelt breaks from Smith, and that's part of the betrayal of the sub-subtitle. Smith feels betrayed by Roosevelt, and that's why he's going to challenge Roosevelt for that nomination in 1932, a so, real grudge match. Uh like, not, uh, not that we're going to get into politics on this show, which is right. we're an apolitical show. But I'm, ta, now, in, in retrospect, now Tammany seems like it was more effective and got things done since money changes hands and and disreputable things happen anyway. It, it, they were an effective political machine in many respects. They they were. Uh, you'd see. I, I I find quite charming the fact that Charles Murphy who would be the head of, of Tammany, and these other guys would just stand on a, a street corner. You wouldn't even have to go to their house to ask for a favor. You knew where they would be, and they would help you. And then not necessarily in some sort of nefarious way, although, I mean, they knew that you, you should give your support later on. But they did get those things done, but often at, at a great cost. And one of the things which helps make Roosevelt president in 1932 is how he deals with the Tammany scandals. We were talking about Fiorello, uh, La, Fiorello LaGuardia in our last segment um, or last show. And um, this is what Roosevelt has to deal with in cleaning up the Tammany mess. And he does it uh, skating through at the last second because the people out in the hinterlands do not like Tammany at all. You've got to be clean. Well, we're in a future episode, we're going to have Tony Lobianco on, who is an actor who's been in iconic movies like The French Connection, and he recently played Fiorello LaGuardia in a one-man show, which he also wrote and directed, which is pretty incredible. David Petruzia, thank you so much for joining us again. Folks, if you want to read David's books, go to his website, D-A-V-I-D-P-I-E-T-R-U-S-Z-A, davidpetruzia.com. Google him, read his books. They're unputdownable, as Ronald Reagan once said about Tom Clancy's books, but it's a, it's a great word. I don't, I don't know if it's ever going to make the dictionary. David, thanks for joining us here on Stribling's New York, and we will be back after this message.